Well, good morning. As the uh, panelists and our moderator um, take their seats, um, as we started planning uh, this year's conference, one of the things that, that I'd brought up was, let's talk about some of the, the precedent that is out there that conservatives are, uh, are not excited about or that has been in the debate. And one of those precedents uh, is New York Times v. Sullivan, Justice Thomas and both, uh, and Justice Gorsuch have been critical of the, uh, the, the holding of New York Times v. Sullivan and it became extremely relevant uh, when Governor DeSantis proposed some legislation to tackle um, defamation and libel laws in the state of Florida. Uh, so really excited to hear this panel. We've got some uh, great members on both sides of this opinion, and we've got a great moderator. Uh, so without further ado, I wanna introduce our moderator who will introduce all of our speakers. Uh, Jesse Panuccio is a great friend uh, to the Florida Fed SOC, he, he was the third highest ranking member of the Department of Justice in the Trump administration. He was the general counsel for Rick Scott. He was the head of the uh, now defunct de uh, Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, well, that seems harsh. <laughs> successor entity, I think, is the... Um, and, uh, and he's a, por a partner at Boyce Schiller, um, but Jesse is a, is a huge friend, and I cannot think of anybody better to moderate this panel uh, than Jesse. So Jesse, please take it away. Well, thanks, Nick. Appreciate that very much. And uh, thanks for everyone for being up for a morning panel. Uh, if I wasn't moderating, I'd still be sleeping on Saturday. So credit to all of you for, for doing it. Thanks to Lisa and her whole team for hosting uh, not one, but two really major events in Florida every year for the Federalist Society, so appreciate that. Uh, this morning, uh, this is the first panel of the conference. Our topic is New York Times v. Sullivan. New York Times, as many of you know, uh, held that the First Amendment protects false or damaging statements made about public officials for <coughs> official conduct, and that to recover in tort or under libel or defamation laws for such statements, a public official, quote, uh, or the plaintiff uh, must show the statement was made with actual malice, that is, knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. The court explained that this rule flowed from the background of a profound national commitment to the principle that a debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. Further, the court reasoned that uh, erroneous statement is inevitable in free debate and that it must be protected if the freedoms of expression are to have the breathing space that they need. Now, I'll just point out, maybe to preview my own views on this a little bit, that that sounds quite similar to what we often say in the conservative world about the right to be wrong on college campuses. So if you're critical of New York Times v. Sullivan, think about what that might mean for your views in, in other areas where you say, error is part of what the First Amendment protects. There have, as I've just previewed though, been many critics of New York Times v. Sullivan over the years. It has not been as uh, just Justice Thomas or Justice Gorsuch as you might think. There are, if you go back to the original case and follow discussions of it through the years, you will see multiple well-respected justices dissenting or concurring over the years and saying, I'm not sure that New York Times v. Sullivan got it right. Uh, but most recently, and perhaps most famously, Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch have penned uh, dissents from denial of, of cert and other opinions. Uh, if you want to look at those, the cases are McKee and Barisha are two of them. But Justice Thomas has called New York Times v. Sullivan a policy-driven decision masquerading as constitutional law. Uh, and, and he goes through the, what he thinks is the original history that cuts against that. Justice Gorsuch does the same. Uh, but on a policy note, he has said that the considerations that animated New York Times flowed from the media environment at the time with comparatively few platforms, but that now everyone carries a soapbox in their hands, which facilitates the spread of disinformation. Further, and this I'm quoting, it seems that publishing without investigation, fact-checking, or editing has become the optimal legal strategy. That's according to Justice Gorsuch. So all of this raises a number of interesting questions that we'll get to. Uh, is there an originalist basis for protecting criticism of public officials and official conduct? Uh, even if New York Times was correct, should it have been expanded in subsequent cases to quasi-public figures? In other words, people who do not hold official government positions and you're not criticizing or speaking about official government conduct. If we abandon New York Times, what replaces it? What is the re what's in all of these issues? If you want to get rid of a long-held doctrine, what comes next is an important question. Uh, I think an important question is in a world where there's conservative speech is in the minority and the media 
and our institutions are controlled by the left wing, is New York Times not protective of conservatives and should we be worried about that? And why is it so hard to win a libel case even under New York Times? There still is a standard there, and presumably you can prove knowing falsity, uh, yet we don't see many successful libel cases. So that's an interesting question as well. So to discuss the past, present, and future of New York Times and libel law, we are privileged to be joined by a distinguished panel this morning. I'll introduce each panelist briefly, uh, highlighting only a few of their many accomplishments. Uh, and then we'll dive right into it. Uh, so I think I may have the order wrong, and I, I apologize. Uh, Joe Cohen serves as director of FIRE's legislative and policy department, overseeing a team of attorneys and staff tasked with monitoring and engaging on legislation and regulatory matters. Under his leadership, FIRE has secured numerous victories for free speech and due process at the state and federal level. Joe is a 2004 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School and Fells Institute of Government Administration, where he earned his Juris Doctor and Master's Degree in Government Administration. In 2000, he graduated with distinction from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Jared Ede is the former uh, Chief Legal Officer of Project Veritas. Jared oversaw Veritas's defamation lawsuit against the New York Times, which survived a motion to dismiss the first under New York's new anti-slap law. Jared is now a litigator at Clark, uh, Claire Locke LLP, the defamation firm that filed the lawsuit against the Times. Uh, Carol Jean LoCicero is managing partner of Thomas and LoCicero's Tampa office. She practices at the trial and appellate levels handling litigation concerning defamation and privacy, the Public Records Act, the Government and the Sunshine Law, court access and cameras in the courtroom. She leads advocacy efforts on media issues, including cameras in the courtroom. Uh, and sealed records. She is the immediate past chair of the First Amendment Foundation's Board of Trustees and is a governing committee member of the ABA Forum on Communications Law. And then, pardon me, but my notes are a little scattered. Uh, Prof Carson Holloway is professor of political science and department chair at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, I apologize, but my notes are a little short on that. I think I, I left something off, so I'm going to have you kick it off, and then I'm going to read more of your bio. After so, Professor, let me I believe you're going first. So I think Joe's I think going I was going. Oh, you're going first. Well, right over, so. then my notes are bad. So take it away. Well, <laughs> sorry about that. No worries. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us this morning. It's really a great honor uh, to be with all of you today and to get us started. Uh, my role today is to talk about why New York Times versus Sullivan is not only right, but really incredibly important for the First Amendment. In fact, in my view, it's the single most important case for the First Amendment because it really gets to the heart of our ability to talk about things that aren't just you know, personal items, but matters of public concern with the breathing room to get things wrong. Because let's face it, every single one of us has gotten a fact wrong in our life or will. I know I will at some point. Um, <laughs> a long enough timeline. Um, but that's kind of the point, which is that the case itself talks about the breathing room that we need in order to be able to talk about matters of public concern. And that's why the case's progeny also talks about not just government officials, but when there's a major controversy, do you have strict liability? Is it just negligence? You know, before you could be held you know, accountable uh, and lose financial damages of uncapped amounts? Uh, or, uh, or do you really have to have this standard of recklessness, the knowing that something was false or a reckless disregard for whether it's likely to be false? And all of that makes sense in a world where you want people to be able to debate things, where you want people to be able to be themselves when they debate things. Think of every single politician you have ever heard speak can you think of any of them that have never gotten a fact wrong about their opponent? And we're not talking about opinions, about like judgment calls here, but a fact wrong about their opponent. Or a study where they cited a wrong statistic, or what have you, where they make that the basis of the allegation you know, of their character. And of course, character is always at play when we're talking about government officials. So all of these kind of aspects of things that people want to talk about when people are in the public sphere <laughs> kind of come into play. And it's this breathing room that gives us the ability to have a democracy. So that's the general gist uh, of, the, of the 
basic argument for why it's so important that we have a robust and strong protection, and it's not just for the press, it is also for every one of us in order to not be able to have liability when we say something wrong about someone who wants to shut you up. And, you know, we at FIRE have historically dealt with higher ed, um, and that's uh, only this last year that we've expanded to broader free speech you know, rights that we advocate for, but in our history we've had case after case after case after case where a lawmaker is upset about something that a professor has said about them and tried to get them fired or tried to shut them up in some way or another. And if they also had the avenue of going to court to sue them to oblivion, that would also be very you know, common practice. And it won't just stop at faculty, it'll stop at anyone who insults someone else who's in power. It's really the ability of the little guy to criticize people who have power and to debate and discuss matters, any matter of public concern robustly. And I don't know that I need to go further into that in the opening kind of salvo. I guess I will turn it over to, uh, to uh, the next. Well, so I, I think, am I right, Professor, you're next? I think that's correct. Okay, well let me just <clears throat> give you a proper introduction then before you go since I didn't do that. But Dr. Holloway is a professor of political science at the University of Nebraska Omaha where he has taught since 2002. He received a BA in political science from the University of Northern Iowa in 91 and in political science, uh, a PhD in political science from Northern Illinois University in 1998. In 2005 and 2006, he was William E. Simon Visiting Fellow in Religion and Public Life at Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals Institutions. He's been a Visiting Fellow in American Political Thought at the Heritage Foundation. Please take it away. All Thank right, you. thanks. It's an honor to be here. I was thinking, uh, I was at the airport very early yesterday morning and I happened to run into a colleague, a retired colleague, who was on his way to vacation by chance. He asked me where I was going and I told him, I'm gonna be on a panel at Federal Society, Young Lawyers Summit, and he said to me, as I might have expected, but you're not a lawyer, and you're not young. <laughs> like, <laughs> way to build up a pal's confidence. Um, so I hope that what I have to say, I appreciate your listening to the musings of an old political scientist. My job is to make the originalist case against New York Times versus Sullivan, and I wanna just make two points very briefly. Um, first, I'll argue that the libel standards uh, devised and imposed in the New York Times case are inconsistent with the original understanding of freedom of the press. And second, I just want to take a moment and respond to what I think is the, uh, if I may be permitted to say it this way, the fake originalism that Justice Brennan does in New York Times versus Sullivan. So my first point, just to recap, and as we've been told, New York Times versus Sullivan holds, and later on cases uh, add to this by expanding from public officials to public figures, that those folks have to show actual malice to prevail in a libel action. That is, they have to show that a defamatory falsehood was published about them, and that the defamatory falsehood was published with knowledge that it was false, or with reckless disregard as to whether it was true or false. And the court, as we were just told, imposed this doctrine to protect First Amendment values, to protect the vigorous public debate that we need for a thriving democracy. So that approach, I would say, is alien to the understanding of freedom of the press uh, that prevailed at the time of the founding. So New York Times, for the first time, the court treated defamatory or libelous utterances as if they create a constitutional problem or trigger a constitutional inquiry. But the founders' approach was simpler um, it was simply that libelous statements are just outside the scope of the freedom of the press. Hence the long-standing uh, understanding in American jurisprudence that libel, along with obscenity and fighting words, are just unprotected speech, which is a view that's found in many textbooks and even paid lip service to in some recent cases. So the understanding the founder, founders had, rather, or the original understanding, was inherited from the common law uh, traditions of English law as expounded by William Blackstone, it was reiterated by famous figures like James Kent, James Wilson, Joseph Story in their commentaries on American law and American constitutionalism. And to illustrate it, I just want to read a passage from a libel case from 1825, Dexter versus Speer, in which Joseph Story was acting as a circuit judge. Here's what he said. In the context of discussing what libel means, Story says, no man has a right to state of another that which is false and injurious to him. A fortiari, no man has a right to give it wider and more mischievous range by publishing it in a newspaper. The liberty of speech or of the press has nothing to do with this subject. 
They are not endangered by the punishment of libelous publications. The liberty of speech and of the press do not authorize malicious and injurious defamation. There can be no right in printers any more than in any other persons to do wrong. So you can tell from that passage that the concepts that are essential to the New York Times analysis are not found in the libel jurisprudence of the founding era. The theory and the practice of the time did not distinguish between public officials, public figures, and private persons. It didn't hold that some had to meet certain standards to prevail and others had to meet other standards to prevail. Malice was thought to be an essential element of libel. You can tell from the passage I just read, Story mentioned malice, but it wasn't actual malice in the New York Times sense. Um, you didn't have to demonstrate that the statement was knowingly false or made recklessly. Rather, if it was false or defamatory, the law presumed its maliciousness. So that's a general sketch of the way the founders thought about this. I just want to make a second point on what I called Brennan's uh, kind of failed effort at originalism in the New York Times case. So in his opinion, Brennan tries to create an aura of originalist legitimacy uh, by appealing to the debate in the 1790s over the Sedition Act. Now the Sedition Act made seditious libel a crime, criminal libel in that case. Um, it also made truth a defense for a claim of seditious libel, but it was nevertheless held by many people to be unconstitutional, and therefore Brennan concludes that the history, the early history of the Republic shows that the First Amendment must protect even speech that is false and defamatory. I think there's several problems there. One is, Justice Brennan says that the Sedition Act was found unconstitutional in the court of history. And he has to say that because it was never found unconstitutional in any real court. Um, in the real courts of the time, people were prosecuted successfully. So there was no uh, exercise of judicial review at the time of the founding uh, holding that uh, the Sedition Act was unconstitutional. Um, but it's even tendentious to say what he says about the court of history. I mean, it's true that great men like uh, Madison and Jefferson thought the Sedition Act was unconstitutional, but equally great men like Washington, Hamilton, Adams thought it was. And finally on that point, I would note that those who thought it was unconstitutional didn't think it was unconstitutional uh, for the simple reasons that might help Brennan's analysis. In other words, they didn't think that merely because of their understanding of freedom of the press. Remember, Jefferson and Madison were strict constructionists of the federal power. They were defenders of states' rights. They thought that the federal government had no power over the press at all because there was no enumerated power, and then that was backed up by the First Amendment. But even in the context of making those arguments, they admitted that if somebody was defamed, a public official, they could take it into state court and sue. So I think if you look under the hood there, the uh, arguments that they derive from the Sedition Act are not as good as they at first appear. And so for those reasons, I'm sympathetic to the view that if you believe in originalist interpretation, the court ought to reconsider New York Times versus Sullivan. I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Appreciate those comments. So I think, is it? Jared going next. Hi, everybody. So again, you know, great honor to be here, um, especially amongst these brilliant panelists. Um, I appreciate everybody being here on an early Saturday morning when it's really, really hot, dressed up to the nines. It's pretty, pretty uh, amazing commitment to the law. Um, obviously, with my history, I, I'm not a huge fan of the New York Times versus Sullivan and the actual malice standard. Uh, Alexander Mickeljohn and his article about a long law review article about the First Amendment and whether or not it was absolute, made the argument that an informed people is essential to a functioning democracy. And it goes to the heart of whether or not what we are being told by our media, which plays an important part, it's supposed to be the fourth estate of our, our nation, right? Whether or not what we are being told by the media is the truth. And I think the heart of defamation law and defamation practice is about getting to the truth and ensuring that there is incentives in the market to, uh, to publishing that. Um, in one of his dissents here, the, the Justice uh, Gorsuch referenced a uh, financial market incentive in that vein um, to telling the truth, making the argument that ultimately people will pay more for news and pay more attention to the news, ultimately, if they, they think they're being told the truth. Uh, recent Gallup polls said that less than 10% of Republicans have great confidence in that fact when it comes to mass media. Lest you think that is a partisan issue, less than 10% of Democrats have great confidence in that fact either. 
So this tells us that there's something broken in the media system. Now, one person who uh, in particular has drawn my ire over the years, Dean Baquet, the editor-in-chief, uh, former editor-in-chief of the New York Times, uh, he made the argument at one point that in fact the reason why no one believes in the media anymore is because of President Trump. Um, but the facts tell a completely different story. In 2005, 70% of Democrats had great confidence in mass media. Uh, by the time that Trump took office, that had plummeted by 19 percentage points. So this is a trend that has been happening for a very, very long time, and you have to ask yourself, why is that? Is that because the media is in fact incentivized right now to be telling the truth, or is it because we have seen time and time again where mass media has brazenly lied to their audience. Uh, Justice Gorsuch put it this way, over time the actual malice standard has evolved from a high bar to recovery into an effective immunity from liability. As uh, Jesse explained, he, he called that, said that publishing without investigation, fact checking or editing has become the optimal legal strategy. Ignorance is bliss under the New York Times versus Sullivan standard. Defamation trials have gone down in 2018. He referenced that only three defamation uh, cases went to trial. If you win, 20% will see the award eliminated on post-trial motion. If you win that, 90% will see a chance of reversal on appeal. So what does that do to a media who ultimately looks at those statistics and looks at those, uh, the case law that is developing around that and says, ultimately, I've gotten virtually a 0% chance of being found liable and having my, uh, my, my reporter's notebook, if you will, opened up as to what I was actually thinking at the time. And what they were thinking at the time is incredibly important. The actual malice standard is a subjective standard. What was the reporter thinking at the time they wrote the article? Now, if you think, well, no big deal, we can depose the reporter. Well, good luck with that with the anti-slap laws that are proliferating around the country. And that, therein lies the problem. The people who are lied about by the media ultimately have such high hurdles to be able to overcome these, these issues, and they don't have the tools necessary to be able to do it. There's a, a saying that is, um, a, a friend of mine really, really likes, and uh, I, I happen to like it as well, it's, which is, a lie travels halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. The truth is incredibly important, and I think everybody agrees that lies have damaging consequences, whether you look at, from one perspective, what happened with January 6th, to another perspective with what is happening with, for example, the Department of Homeland Security, SISA, and the Election Integrity Partnership and censorship efforts on that side, everyone tends to agree that lies have a damaging effect on society. If you were to go into someone's building where they work and burn down their business, everyone would agree that liability should happen. Yet somehow under the New York Times versus Sullivan standard, a newspaper, a CNN uh, uh, publication, a, a article that ultimately commits, in this sense, journalistic arson to someone's business and livelihood, the standard is so high that you almost have, again, a 0% chance of being able to prevail on, uh, in trial and having that stand all the way through appeal. Sullivan and its progeny have killed the incentive for truthful reporting, making the economic model shift towards less investigation as articles prompt lawsuits, the media responds as they did in my New York Times case when we sued the New York Times uh, and, and got past motion to dismiss. They argue, well, what we wrote in the article, these things that we said that were damaging about you, that we presented to our readers as fact, well, they weren't fact at all. They were opinions. And so, as a result, they should not be actionable. Never mind that they were published in a news section by a reporter and not labeled anywhere as unverifiable. As uh, the, a, can paraphrase their, their motto, all the news that's fit to unverify. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for those com comments. Uh, Carol, if you give us your opening remarks and then we'll turn to some debate and questions. I'm feeling lonely down here. <laughs> um, 
I was asked to talk about like sort of the practical impacts uh, in newsrooms and, and, and my practice of New York Times versus Sullivan and its progeny. Um, and just so you kind of understand what a First Amendment or media lawyer like me does, um, these are sort of typical weeks for me. Um, maybe helping with a news gathering issue, uh, someone's trying to get public records. Maybe doing a pre-publication review of a story that an editor has deemed um, potentially risky or particularly sensitive. Uh, then I might be filing motions in a libel case um, defending um, a speaker. Uh, and as well, we might be dealing with demands for uh, retraction of, of news stories. So um, my practice is a mix of litigation and non-litigation. I think that's pretty typical of lawyers who do what I do. The practical impact of New York Times versus Sullivan to me is um, different when you're talking about the litigation versus the non-litigation side of the practice. So when you're talking about the non-litigation side of my practice and reviewing stories, for example, um, New York Times versus Sullivan's impact in my experience has been negligible. That is not a main topic of conversation. It's an old movie, so I'm dating myself among a group of young lawyers, but absence of malice where the lawyer, the in-house lawyer sitting at the table circles a couple of things and say, says, you know, there's no knowing falsity here. You can publish, go ahead. Um, that doesn't resemble what vetting looks like. What vetting or pre-publication review looks like is often almost a line-by-line -line review of the story to understand what the basis is for it, the sourcing, whether public records are involved, identifying risks, figuring out what is opinion versus fact, and, and how you state that. Um, the way that uh, the media is described and lumped together as sort of a one monstrous body of um, lie purveyors is not my experience of of how um, reporters actually are day to day. Um, I find them to be generally thoughtful, concerned, educated people who have chosen a profession when they could have made a lot more money doing something else, but they believed in this and wanted more of a vocation than um, just a lucrative career, not that there's anything wrong with making money. The So my day to day life, um, the perceptions I think that people have of the media, frankly, doing what I do generally has given me a lot more confidence in the news. Um, so I really don't, I'm not saying that the media is perfect. You know, what what they're doing is, is one of the ways it's been described is sort of writing history as it unfolds, and that's difficult. Um, with breaking news, you're, you're on the outside looking in, trying to get facts and get that information quickly to the public. Even when you're doing investigative pieces and invest more time in it, um, you're again, you, you, you know, reporters have no subpoena power. They can't compel um, people to talk. They can't compel people to provide documents unless they're public records and we want to sue um, if we're not being given the records by government. Uh, so they're, they are from the outside looking in and trying to report about our world. And a lot of the debate and criticism of, of the quote media seems to revolve these days around national politics. Um, but the media does a lot more than national politics. They cover your local school board meetings and um, city council meetings and county commission meetings and the legislative sessions and day-to-day uh, -day sort of stuff that's going on in our town, crimes, whatever, you know, development is going on. Um, and, and, and to sort of view with disdain the work of the media is really, in my opinion, to, to sort of undermine um, the way that our society was designed to function. We participated in a revolution. Um, what happened in England is not a roadmap for speech in this country. Um, England doesn't have a First Amendment. So, you know, I realize that I probably look at things from a view that's 
and a standpoint that's very different, but this is my, my personal experience. From a practical standpoint, when you move into litigation, actual malice often plays a role if someone is um, a high, higher profile person, if they're in the midst of a controversy, or if they're a government official. And under Florida law, everyone who's employed by the government is not a government official. So there's, there has to be some sort of policy making aspect to their job. That's a criticism I hear a lot that like, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, the janitor who works for the, you know, the State Department of Environmental Protection, you know, has to satisfy the actual malice standard. Um, that is not necessarily true. So. In litigation, though, the actual malice standard definitely comes into play. Um, many cases involve multiple defenses. I'm sure a lot of the defense lawyers in this room would uh, agree with me that, like, you're not quick to just decide, you know, oh, that we can throw that defense out because we have others. Um, the actual malice standard is often the defense that sort of spans all of the statements at issue. So one might be protected by the fair report privilege, which permits in Florida um, sort of uh, accurate reporting uh, of the contents of government documents, even if they're wrong. Um, but another statement in a story might not be protected by that privilege, but often actual malice is sort of an overarching defense that applies um, ac across the board. So. Um, it does come up a lot. It comes up on in motion practice. It's involved um, in discovery, um, and and normally is one among many grounds for defending a lawsuit. Um, but obviously, I'm a fan of New York Times versus Sullivan, and and whatever may have been said in the uh, Barisha and and McKee um, uh, dissents. You know, counterman at the end of June, which was a truth that threats sort of a case, like a stalking kind of uh, pinging someone over and over and over again on um, through social media, uh, has essentially, in my mind, sort of reaffirmed New York Times versus Sullivan. It was a big part of the um, of the the majority opinion. Uh, Justice Thomas was the only dissenting voice criticizing the core of Sullivan with arguments similar to what he made in, in his other dissents from um, cert denials. And, you know, Justice Kagan wrote the opinion. Uh, Justice Kagan was kind of sort of countered because of a law review article that she wrote as a professor in possible votes to overturn New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, so, you know, I can certainly... Uh, talk at length about my experience with newsrooms and, and uh, New York Times and its progeny, uh, but that's really uh, my sort of practical experience with, with the case. Well, thank you very much. Very helpful to get uh, that on the ground perspective. So uh, I have some questions for the panel, but I would like to give everyone the chance if there's anything you want to say in response to opening remarks of your co-panelists, please feel free. If not, I'll launch into questions. I definitely have a few things uh, to say. Uh, you know, to begin with, I think even if you look back at, you know, the early 19th century, so well before New York Times versus Sullivan, there are strings of cases that deal with the question of when there can be liability you know, for criticizing, you know, the government you know, and whether or not when individuals said, well, you were criticizing the government, but I'm the person who is, you know, the elected official here, so it was clearly veiled, threat, veiled on me. You know, the case law talks about needing that extra wiggle room. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm skeptical of this argument that, you know, you get to New York Times versus Sullivan and all of a sudden they decide that you can't, you know, have strict liability. And that ultimately is, the cornerstone of the argument, which is once you say something wrong, you have libeled someone. The moment you say something wrong on the facts in a way that could at all affect their reputation, and of course, reputation is what government is about, right? Tr trust in the people who are running for office, they're relying on their reputation. Once you get any fact wrong, you have libeled them. And then libel is unprotected. That is simply unworkable. 
None of you could have a world in which a democracy functions where there's strict liability. None of you could do that and have a democracy. It just does not exist because we all get things uh, wrong. And you know, I want to put this in a little bit of context because the, what's at stake here is that it, it, w with adjusting these standards isn't necessarily just who wins at the end of a lawsuit. It's about how far a lawsuit gets, right? And that it matters if you have to spend six years on lawyers to defend and have tons of liability versus getting out earlier. And I want you to consider this. There's research done about 1964, the year that Sullivan was decided. And in that year, there was roughly $300 million worth of claims against newspapers for their coverage of the civil rights movement, mostly against civil rights activists accusing government actors of trying to trying to suppress civil rights. If you translate that into 2023 20, dollars just through inflation, you're talking about $2.9 billion worth of liability. Do you think that amount of risk might shut some people up? Might silence people if that was what could happen if they lost at the end for getting anything wrong? And do you think that it matters if you had to hire attorneys to go through years and years to defend it? I think it does. And I don't think that you could have uh, a system function uh, without having that breathing room. And I just want to echo on one other thing that Carol you know, ended with, which is countermen. Just two weeks ago, you not only had the majority opinion say and analogize mostly to Sullivan in dealing with the true threats doctrine and dealing with recklessness as a standard and saying how if it works in defamation, the true threats recklessness should work here. But you also have the Sotomayor and Gorsuch concurrence from both of them in which they say New York Times versus Sullivan makes sense makes sense. So the idea that you're, you're going to have like the court all of a sudden decide that you're going to move to a narrower liability standard is very unlikely, but also it would be very damaging to not just the mainstream media as you see it, but conservative media. Well, how do you think it will deal with, with ta any talk radio that you, you know, hear? Would Alex Jones be thrilled with having a lower standard? Doubt it. Um, or any of the other channels that I'm often and repeatedly a guest on uh, that, could, you know, that deal with talking about lawmakers and making allegations against them. What about all of the allegations about Biden's mental health? What happens since, for those of you who are not physicians, if you're wrong on any detail of it by even an inch, are you strictly liable now? Any of you individuals or every member of the press who wants to write about it? I mean, at some point, you have to be practical. And that's kind of where I'm going to let it lie. All right, other responsive comments? Could I get, say just a little bit on that? I think Joe's right that in the 19th century, there's evidence of courts being aware of the wiggle room you have to have when you're talking about a public official or a public figure. They're, when they talk about freedom of the press, they do always say that part of the reason we have it is because we live in a self-governing society. But they don't go so far as to embrace the New York Times standard. And I think what the court did in the original opinion, is they didn't invent it out of whole cloth because it did exist in some jurisdictions. They go to Kansas Supreme Court. Um, but it goes without saying that the Kansas Supreme Court can't give an authoritative interpretation of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. So there's been some movement in that direction, but it's not, I don't think it's the dominant tradition. That's why I do regard New York Times versus Sullivan as a kind of break. And then if I could just say one other thing, and I would have put this in my original comments if there were time, but now's the time to say it. I want to expand a little bit on what I think Justice Thomas means when he says it was a policy-driven decision. Because I think what the court did in New York Times versus Sullivan is not only inconsistent with the original meaning of freedom of the press, but also with the original understanding of the proper exercise of the judicial power. Um, if, I mean, I'm getting this from Justice Scalia, but I think he's correct about this, that we have judicial review because the Constitution is law, like any other law. And so when judges are con uh, confronted with conflicting laws, they have to figure out what they mean, and they have to give effect to the law that's controlling in the particular case. If it involves the Constitution, it's a supreme law, so it'll be controlling. If you go back, which I highly recommend, and read, um, Chief Justice Marshall's opinions in the contracts clause cases. That's what he's doing, figuring out what a contract is. 
If this is a contract, we have to do such and such. If it's not, we don't do it. Is a grant a contract? If it is, the answer is a certain thing. If it's not, the answer is something else. What the court's doing in New York Times versus Sullivan and in later cases like Gertz versus Welch is altogether more loosey-goosey, if I can put it that way. <clears throat> they are identifying constitutional values and then they're trying to invent standards to protect those values, strategic protections for speech that's not protected in order to protect the speech that is protected. They are, in Gertz versus Welch, in the words of Justice Powell, trying to strike an equitable balance between uh, reputation on the one hand and uh, vigorous public debate on the other hand. This is all to say it's not judicial review the way the founders envisaged it. It's a kind of judicial policy making, and I think that's what Justice Thomas is concerned with. And that concerns me too. I guess I'll just say one other thing, which is that I have a lot of sympathy for everything Joe said. On the other hand, I think we did have a free society and we had a vigorous free press before 1964. That seems to be the historical experience, so. So let me uh, just exercise some moderator's privilege because I want everybody to get a chance to talk, but I want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience and a few that I have. So I, I did want to ask you something sort of to follow up on that, Dr. Holloway, which is this. Y you know, the New York Times v. Sullivan was written, uh, was published by the court at a time when it was not interested in originalist jurisprudence. So like Brown v. Board, for example, the opinion itself does not contain a uh, particularly uh, robust originalist case. but. Later, when originalism became a much more popular, uh, you know, important part of law, others came around and said, well, you know, to take the Mike McConnell art articles, for example, there is a good originalist case for Brown v. Board, a robust mm -hmm. case. I'm wondering if New York Times v. Sullivan has never received that treatment but could. And I ask that question, for example, because in the founding era, the founding was built upon robust, uh, vigorous, sometimes false criticism of the government. I think there's this document called the Declaration of Independence, which is a long list of grievances against King George, and I bet he would have said some of those are false. Uh, and so you might be able to build from that and say, well, how would we have had a founding with that vigorous uh, and robust criticism of government officials if the libel law at the time would have held everyone uh, liable for significant damages in tort if they could not criticize government officials. And so I just wonder, is the problem here that we have not benefited from serious academic research of the originalist case for something like New York Times v. Sullivan and what your response to that might be? Yeah. And anyone can take that, but I, you, you gave the originalist case against it. So. Right. So I can be brief on that. I mean, I think that could be attempted and there are some things there. Um, but I also think that that attempt would probably not succeed to my satisfaction. I think it would end up, I think an originalist case for the New York Times standards would end up being like an originalist case for strict separation of church and state. It would be tendentious cherry picking of certain things that people of the founding generation said and not really be based on the overall uh, public culture of how they understood these things. But yeah, I mean, if you delve into Madison and Jefferson and certain like Saint, okay, let me, I'll just say this real quick. I was reading all these cases to prepare for a class. I mean, you know, Justice Black's dissent, Justice Black thought there should be no libel laws at all, right? There should be no liability at all. He thought the First Amendment precludes that entirely. And he makes a, you can get away with this, I guess, if you're a Supreme Court justice. He has a sentence where he says, the general view of the founding was this. And you look at the footnote, it's a footnote to St. George Tucker, who's a you know, Jeffersonian Republican lawyer. There's no Blackstone, there's no anything else. So, I mean, you could try that, but I think that's about as far as you would get. Okay. Let me. Uh, I will just briefly. Please. In. No, I'm gonna, <laughs> there I'm there gonna actually have something has to been the number amount of research done into it, and there are some articles that, that make that make the case. And I, I I read one in preparation of this, and I was furiously looking for it on my phone to remind myself who the author of it was, and I could not find it in my email, so I apologize. But uh, but it has happened because I just read it. <laughs> There's a recent one. It's 2021, and uh, I think LSU, and it it, it does try to make this case, so it is out yep. there. Um, I wanted to, if you want to comment on this, please, but I, go, have, I actually have a question uh, for you and okay. for Joe, which is, so part of what we're talking about here, and I think it's important for those who aren't familiar with, it, with this, is there's New York Times versus Sullivan, which is about criticism of government officials for their government acts, which is, whether you take it from an originalist view or a legal view or a policy view, that is one sphere. Since then, the doctrine has been expanded to this idea of public figures, which could be something as simple as, nowadays, 
you get caught on a viral video uh, throwing a fit at the airport. And because it's gone viral, you've sort of inserted yourself into a big story, and now you're not protected either. And so uh, I wonder if uh, the two defenders on this panel of sort of New York Times v. Sullivan could comment on whether you think the progeny of that case and the expansion of the doctrine is good or bad. Uh, and related to that, why is it so darn hard to win a libel trial at all, even when you've been libel, I mean, even when there's falsehood, even when you've been damaged in a serious way? Uh, why can't anybody win under the, the current law? So throw that to both of you just to, to get your thoughts. I ask a Dominion voting about whether they need to go to trial to win <laughs> a bunch of money. You know. I guess if you have a lot of pro bono lawyers and a few million dollars, you can win. Or contingent fee. Yeah. The, um, the, there's so many things running through my head right now. Okay, on the originalism issues. Look, we're a room full of lawyers. You know how advocacy works. There is stuff that you can say on one side. There's stuff you can say on the other side. There are law review articles talking about um, you know, commentators at the uh, post-adoption of the Bill of Rights that, that have a basis in, in the commentary at the time for saying that there was an understanding that the breadth of speech, that speech needed to be protected more broadly for public debate purposes. Um, so, you know, we can research ourselves, I believe, in, into knots. Um, the truth is, is that the, you know, why when we enacted a Bill of Rights because of concerns about abuse by the government in England um, and the king, what, would we be relying on Blackstone to interpret those rights? We made a break in certain areas that was extremely clear and an extreme deviation from what happened in England. Um, I will say that the, um, if, you're, if you're an originalist and you're, and you're also concerned about words, I mean, what does the amendment say? Shall make no law. There's a basis for saying that it's an absolutist provision. We don't have an absolutist provision. Um, we have something that is more of a, a thoughtful balance between truth, um, between the issues related to defamation and truth and falsity and, and liability and strict liability and all that. The, um, the question that I've been asked about the public figure doctrine, um, you have to understand there is a massive, massive body of case law interpreting New York Times versus Sullivan, Gertz versus Welch, St. Amant, all of the seminal constitutional cases on um, the, the uh, government official and public figure doctrines. Um, we litigate those issues. We don't always win. Everybody is not a public figure. Um, we lose those, those um, and it's kind of a two-part thing when you're in, in that context. First, you litigate the public figure aspect because until that's decided, you don't know what the fault standard is. But um, I, I will grant you that in, in um, you know, a lot of cases, the actual malice standard is an important um, defense. I will not just say that everyone in the world is a public figure because we have Facebook. I don't, that's not my experience. And what does it take just for those who don't like what, what, can you just give us an example of who would qualify and who wouldn't under cases you've seen? Sure. The, the general, the, you know, there's the public figure concept is divided. There's, there's, a general purpose public figure, think of someone like, you know, Beyonce or Michael Jordan or, you know, Tom Brady, people who just live these extremely public lives um, and everyone sort of knows that they have access to, to the media to respond. And, the, and, and in these days, you don't really need access to the media to respond anymore. You just tweet or 
thread or you know truth social or whatever it is that you <laughs> whatever you want to use you can get out information to the public directly so those general purpose public figures are few and far between but they're super famous people um, the limited purpose public figure doctrine is much more nuanced um, yes you can inject yourself into a public controversy and that's what the McKee case was about um, accusing uh, Bill Cosby of, of rape um, and there the the what happened was she, was McKee was deemed a limited purpose public figure because she was injected into that controversy. She and she voluntarily injected herself by becoming public with um, those claims against Bill Cosby. That would be an example. And of course, Justice Thomas didn't think that speaking out about what had happened to her um, should have been the kind of thing that would trigger analysis of the limited purpose public figure doctrine. So, you know, I can't give you like, uh, okay, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're always gonna be a limited purpose public figure. That's gonna be litigated heavily with, a, a, with the court. Um, it's gonna be often a factual as well as a legal um, battle. But um, you, people do seem to know when someone's a government official uh, or a, a general purpose public figure much more easily. Thank you. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to go to Joe briefly uh, to add on to that, and then I have a couple of questions for Jared. But uh, I think we have a, a little less than a half hour left in the panel. So if you have uh, audience questions in about when we're done with this next round, just start teeing up at the microphones, and I'll, uh, if there are people there, I'll take audience questions. If not, I'll keep asking questions. But Joe, why don't you just give us yeah. a little addendum to what Carol said, and then Jared, I have a I'll separate really question for you. Quick with the snippet. I mean, I think that the hardest part is with the limited public figure uh, doctrine, because I think the real key principle that we're trying to protect here is that when even a private citizen who isn't ordinarily out in the public is a central figure in something that we're all going to debate as a society about what our laws should look like, what our criminal justice system should look like, you know, what racism or not, or whatever, the public thing that we're really going to discuss, you know, the who, what, when, and why, who is always part of the question, who they are, who's reliable and who's not reliable, is important and it kind of opens people up for more scrutiny when they're a central figure in a fact pattern like that. Um, but when they're, when it's really about something more petty or smaller, uh, it, it probably shouldn't, and that's why it's a very fact-based analysis and very difficult to to kind of set a bright line. Um, and why it wouldn't surprise me if there are sometimes courts that applied the higher standard of people who maybe should get a little bit more protection from, you know, defamation in that context. And it wouldn't be surprise me if they erred in the other direction in another case, depending on the quality of lawyering, et cetera, and other variables. So with that. So thank you. Uh, so Jared, I have two questions for you, a little bit unrelated, but I uh, want to make sure I, I get them both out. So one, I want you to tell us a little bit about the case that you had against New York Times. That's one that's, a, I think, an important example and, and something for everyone to consider. And then separately, uh, I guess for this crowd especially, which is mostly made up of, of conservative and, and libertarian lawyers uh, and maybe commentators and uh, political actors, isn't it if you're critical of New York Times v. Sullivan and getting rid of it, isn't it in today's environment conservatives who actually need that kind of protection? I, you know, I watched Fox and Friends this morning, uh, and frankly, the Katie Fang show on MSNBC, and on both of them, I heard at least 10 false statements just on the way down here. Uh, but, but, you know, conservatives, and now that we have Twitter and Facebook, and, and they're out there criticizing corporations and government, don't we, as conservatives, need that protection? So. One's a factual question, tell us about your case. Two, tell us about that policy issue and, and where you would go if, if we don't have that. Yeah, so answering these in slight reverse here, I, I think you know conservatives and liberals alike need the truth more than anything else. And shaping our policies around, again, incentivizing reporters to tell the truth and seek out and publish the truth is really what we should be focused on. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of talk, for example, about how long litigation lasts in this case. You know, for example, Joe, you'd mentioned cases that last up to six years, and that, this is, that's not an exaggeration. That happens. We have a case that's uh, been ongoing at Claire Locke for, I think, upwards of seven years now. 
um, you know, the Dominion case that we litigated. That case began in effectively January after the election. And we're three years out now. And we're just now getting that case resolved. And that's only because it's a settlement. There are six, I believe, six other cases that are pending right now regarding the D Dominion falsehoods that exist. And contrary to Dominion being an example of, well, gee, you can win at you know, uh, these, these defamation cases. Of course, Dominion had some really, really egregious facts in that case where very clearly falsity was established. I mean, the, the Delaware uh, court in that case said that no reasonable person could actually determine or say that the things that were said about Dominion were true. Um, so that, again, the, the facts in that particular case were, were very unique. Contrary to that being an example of, hey, you can win in defamation, it's actually a very, very good example of how complacent the media has gotten with the New York Times versus Sullivan Standard with the idea that, gee, we are untouchable as a result of that. And touching on your first question, Jesse, with the New York Times case that we brought uh, when I was uh, chief legal officer at Project Veritas, it, it goes right to the heart of, again, the length of litigation and how difficult these cases actually are for the people who have been lied about. In that case, the New York Times had claimed that something Project Veritas had published about Minnesota ballot harvesting was false and, and misleading and deceptive. Um, we brought a lawsuit. The New York Supreme Court, um, Justice Charles Wood, said no, it was not in fact false, and in fact said that the New York Times had engaged in deception and disinformation in the way that they had published the article, claiming that it was in one hand factual when it was published in, in the A section of the New York Times, yet when we sued, claiming that no, it's now opinion and not verifiable fact. Um, we won that motion to dismiss, which by the way was because of the New York Times versus Sullivan standard, one of, we counted I believe less than 10 cases since the New York Times versus Sullivan came down, uh, where the New York Times had not won their motion to dismiss. I mean, that's crazy. Um, now. What's really, really crazy about this is we win that case. Not a single deposition has been taken. Not a single uh, reporter's note has been turned over in discovery. And why is that? Because the New York Times appealed and it has been in the Court of Appeals for over two years, sitting with no activity whatsoever. So you have to ask yourself, when you have someone in that case, and regardless of who it is, it could be Project Veritas, it could be your local neighborhood, you know, Spider-Man, if you will. <laughs> um, but when you have a case where somebody has, by a court of law, been determined to have been lied about in a way that was quote unquote disinformation and deceptive, right? Is there justice in making that person wait for two and a half years before they even get to so much as take a deposition to try to satisfy the New York Times versus Sullivan standard, which by the way only gets a high, to a higher level after the motion to dismiss uh, uh, status of the case. So in the end of this, I think ultimately when you look at whether or not New York Times versus Sullivan needs to be revisited, you, again, you have to look at it from the lens of are we incentivizing the truth? And unfortunately, I think the answer has been no. You know, we look at the limited purpose public figures issues, um, it, it's, it's clearly gone astray in many, many cases um, where, you know, for example, people who are simply acquaintances of someone who is a actual public figure have been deemed to be limited purpose public figures for the purpose of, of New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, that does need to be drawn back and conservative media, I believe, can benefit from that, uh, that standard at the at Project Veritas knowing that we were not libel proof, right, that we could be sued and, and potentially have uh, lawsuits prevail against us, uh, it drove us to have a much higher fact-checking standard. It drove us to make sure that the stories that were put out had gone through multiple layers of review, including pre-production uh, review as well, to make sure that there was accuracy in what was being published. I don't think that's a bad thing, and I think that needs to happen more. All right, uh, let me, uh, if there are audience questions, there's a microphone there and there in the centers of the room. Uh, if you could just start queuing up at the microphones, we'll take questions. So we have one here to start. Yes, uh, my name's Brian Heckman. I have a question for Professor Holloway and Mr. Edie, um, because obviously you are appearing as the opponents of uh, Sullivan. While what you're saying is, is 
makes sense and is generally well recepted. My concern that I want to bring to you is if the solvent standard is lowered, the possibility of private action as a means of effectively censoring true publication. The example I would give would be the Hunter Biden laptop story. Published by the New York Post in 2020, it was politically disadvantageous to President Biden, and so immediately you had the Democrat-aligned uh, media corporations starting talking about this is Russian disinformation, you had the talking points from the Biden camp, and here we are three years later, turns out all of that was made up, it was in fact true. And, but despite that, to my recollection, there was never any libel or defamation lawsuit filed against the New York Post, possibly because the solvent standard makes it so high that it would be impossible to prevail, to prevail upon. If that standard is eliminated, are you concerned that there could be non-meritorious lawsuits undertaken by individuals published about for true information saying this information is publicly, or excuse me, politically disadvantageous to me and putting the publisher in this Hobbesian choice of, okay, I know this is true, I know I will eventually win this libel lawsuit, but it may incur me ruinous litigation costs, so do I retract this now and save the costs that are incurred to my paper, or do I stick to my guns, and would that cause a chilling effect? Um, well, so here, here's what I'd say to that, which is, I, I think the fear that there would be a glut of frivolous lawsuits if New York Times versus Sullivan were drawn back is, is probably overstated. I think there's a greater chance that right now under the current system, um, under the current standards, that there are numerous meritorious defamation actions which cannot be filed because of the fact that, again, litigation lasts for six years. You cannot find lawyers who know anything about defamation who will take these cases on, on contingency generally, right? These are not easy cases to win. The outlook of, again, being able to, at the end of the day, recover something such that a contingency makes, fa makes sense just doesn't happen. So what does that do? That makes it, it such that ultimately defamation law is reserved for the rich. Is that what we want? Is that really truly in the benefit of New York Times versus Sullivan and what they wanted to do in terms of encouraging di uh, truthful discourse? And I, I think the answer to that is no. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I would say is there, there's insurance for defamation defense. There is not insurance when you're defamed. All right, thank you for the question. And, and thank you for the oh, argument. Sorry, yeah, others. <laughs> Can I respond to that? Yeah, please. Yeah, the, um, look, the, the cost of defending these lawsuits is itself a huge um, sort of censorship burden on the media. They, it's, it's not, this sort of cavalier environment where people just publish at will and stay ignorant, um, like Justice Gorsuch suggested, so that they can win a libel lawsuit. I, that is not what's happening. And the reason that anti-slap statutes are being adopted in different states is because of tort reform issues. And for every case that a, a plaintiff's libel lawyer can point out saying that it was unfair that they didn't succeed or that it was unfair that, you know, uh, the case never got brought. I, I guarantee I can match you about two for one on ridiculous claims that we have had to defend for the, for the media. And we don't just represent whatever anybody calls the liberal media. We've had cases where we've defended Newsmax and the uh, Village's Daily Sun. Um, and the, the conservative media came forward with the Florida libel bills um, and Christian publishers. And, and it's, you know, it, it's not reality. And also the New York Times is, is not here to give their side of the Project Veritas cases. So I'm not criticizing um, the, the, the plaintiff side, but, you know, there, there, there are more than, than one side to those cases. Both. Yeah, just real quick. I mean, the question that was posed is sort of a consequentialist question, is beside the point of my argument, although it's a very important question that others here are able to uh, game out. Um, I did want to say, though, this discussion makes me think that it's important to keep in mind that it's possible and even likely true that both Carol and Jared are correct, right? In other words, that most media, most of the time, do a good job, and yet there are instances where they behave abusively. My own personal view of this that I've gotten from watching the news sometimes is that whenever I watch a State Department briefing or a Defense Department briefing, 
my impression of the reporters is very positive, like they're professional and they know what they're doing. Whenever I watch a White House briefing, I think I'm seeing a bunch of grandstanders who don't know how to act. Um, so there could be there's certain divisions in the press where there are cases of abuse that are serious, just as we would say that uh, it's true that the vast majority of physicians are conscientious and do a good job, even though there are cases of malpractice. And when your doctor hurts you through malpractice, you don't have to show that he did it knowingly or recklessly. You only have to show that he did it negligently. So part of the argument is, why is the press held to a different standard than other essential professions like that? And I would love to answer that question. <laughs> because, <laughs> because there's a First Amendment value. <laughs> right, because, and it goes right back to the question you know, from the audience, which is that there is this policy change. I mean, litigation can be used as a tool to intimidate people into silence. If you don't believe that, I don't know what else to tell you other than the fact that there are dozens and 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 I can keep on going for as much time as you want of cases or you know where people want to silence their critics and I'm not and I'm not even talking in the context of New York Times versus Sullivan I'm really talking more about the anti-slap even from the you know from the perspective of a restaurant getting a bad Yelp review for bad you know for bad service and the idea is there and ordinarily conservatives have been strong allies in the argument that we don't want the judicial system used abusively. Of course that means that, you know, that doesn't mean that there isn't, aren't instances where someone is defamed. But New York Times versus Sullivan doesn't create an absolutist rule, it creates a very high bar, uh, but not an absolutist one. Um, and you have that trade-off of where you want to err, and I want to err on not having the justice system being used to intimidate people in silence, because we're not just talking about reporters. I know we're talking about this in terms of the media and saying, well, you know, they should be doing this fact-checking or that fact-checking, et cetera, but it applies to every single person. What facts are you allowed to get wrong when you're having political discussions? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we have another audience question, which I'm going to turn to, and then if we have time, uh, my closing question, I'll just tell you now, because Carol mentioned something about uh, uh, Florida legislature and maybe bills being introduced. So one thing, if we have time, I want to get to is what is happening in the states and what might uh, happen to change the New York Times Sullivan regime, in other words, to get a case up to the court. So that will be my closing question if we have time, but let me turn to an audience member for another question. I'm Isaiah McKinney. Um, I work at the Cato Institute, writing amicus briefs. So I wanted to know, it sounds like both this panels are kind of split coming at this from first, a little bit of different first principles or different goals um, that they want to see with, with it in libel litigation. But I want to know if there's a way you could kind of split the baby. Like, is there a way to narrow the standard just a little bit that would satisfy both the concerns that people should be able to speak falsehoods because they act, happen all the time or accidentally, but also make it a little easier to actually prove um, malicious intent or prove malice than it currently is. Is there a standard that like all four of you would generally be willing to compromise to? I, it's impossible it's not, I'm just, just curious. That's a great question. So let's do this in uh, lightning round format if we can. Uh, so Carol, maybe start with you. Uh, is there any consensus view of this, any <clears throat> slight ratcheting that might, might satisfy both sides of this debate? I'll give you a word, no. It's <laughs> <laughs> the kind of answer we love in a white lightning round. All right, Professor, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, since I think it's all wrong, I mean, if we pulled back to public officials and left out public figures or something like that, that would be a step in the right direction to me. Yeah, so, you know, I, I obviously have a fairly absolutist view when it comes to New York Times versus Sullivan, but I think a good first step would be allowing discovery at an early stage in the case um, if you're going to apply that standard to the defamation litigants, they need an opportunity to be able to satisfy it. And I'd say uh, probably not uh, with respect to the actual malice standard, possibly with the limited public figures doctrine, you know, there could be some room for some refining there that people wouldn't necessarily deem the sky falling if it got tweaked. Um, but on the actual malice standard, the three words, I have three words and the last one would be Jose. <laughs> All right, so we have about five minutes left, and I think a good place to end might be let's look forward a little bit, and that might, you know, what happens going forward may involve what state legislatures are doing. There's been various proposals. So I don't know if maybe everybody, if somebody's well-equipped to answer this, but can you just give us, a, the, the audience, a little information about what are the proposals out there, what's happening, 
uh, on the lawmaking side, not the judiciary side, in, in this area on libel law? Um, I, I was pretty involved in, here in Florida. Um, you know, there, were, there are two different aspects of it. There's the anti-slap aspect, and there's the New York Times versus Sullivan uh, stuff. Now, on the anti-slap, for those of you who aren't familiar, you're talking about strategic you know, lawsuits to, you know, to silence you know, critics. You know, that's what you're talking about with respect to anti-slaps that give the ability to get an early motion to dismiss and kick a case out uh, to protect you know, ordinary citizens and people to be able to speak their minds. Um, and you have over 30 states that have adopted anti-slaps, most of them with near unanimous uh, support. Uh, and support, when I say you're nervous, that obviously implies conservative and uh, liberal and progressive support across the board. Uh, in Florida, there was a bill introduced this year in each chamber, so it had a companion bill that would have changed the New York Times versus Sullivan standard in a number of ways, limited who counts as a public figure, um, and also reversed the anti-slap, making it an actual slap statute, because Florida is one of those states that has an anti-slap. You know, law. So there have been no other states that have introduced bills uh, of late um, that would uh, change the New York Times versus Sullivan standard. I suspect that we'll see uh, more of those uh, get introduced in future sessions. Great. Anyone else want to comment, Carol? Yeah, I just want to say that the, you know, think about what's going on, what went on in Florida with the two bills. You have a federal constitutional standard based on the First Amendment, and then a bill, bills introduced in the Florida legislature that tried to change federal constitutional law. Um, I think that's, a, that's troubling, just as, from a, a policy standpoint and a, a standpoint of the citizenry. You, you cannot change the federal constitution by a single state statute. Um, so, Will we see another bill again? There was a Senate version and a House version. We don't know. The legislative session is earlier um, in 2024 than, than normal. Um, but but the, the bills in, in Florida really were heavily unconstitutional and unlikely to properly tee up the Sullivan question. We'll let the anti-New York Times, the Sullivan side, uh, close it out. What's, what's the future on, on the legislative side, potentially? I don't know what the future is on the legislative side, but can I say something in yeah, response to Carol, which is simply that I agree that if a state legislature tried to uh, reestablish a new standard on their own authority, period, that would be like nullification or what the, uh, the southern states were trying to do in the tariff controversy, and I don't want any part of that. Um, but on the other hand, if they do it with a view to provoking the court to rethink the question, I think that's entirely within their power. Um, and it, you know, it's a good thing to do if you think the court was mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened in Florida wasn't necessarily completely this, this you know, dour, sky is falling piece of legislation. There were bright spots within it. You know, one of the biggest criticisms that I have of mainstream media, and, and I saw this particularly in the New York Times case uh, with, with Project Veritas, is, you know, just as an example, Project Veritas was criticized by the New York Times for using quote unquote anonymous sources. Well, in that particular case, we used anonymous sources because quite literally their lives were threatened. If we had shown their faces, if we had told people who they were, they could have been killed. Um, yet the New York Times turns around and uses anonymous sources all the time and tells you on one hand, you have to satisfy this you know, incredibly high standard of proving what the reporter actually knew or did not know at the time. But by the way, you don't get to know who the witness is that I'm putting on the stand because of the reporter shield. I'm not telling you who my confidential source is. Um, so, you know, things like that that were going to be tweaked in the, the Florida legislation, I think, were helpful. In terms of where I think things are going in the future, I think it's really right now the, the movement is being on uh, anti slap law. New York just passed their anti slap law in. Um, what was that, I believe 2021, um, it's now getting some, you know, case law coming down talking about what it actually means and we're seeing more interest in states across the country to pass those, which I think is going to dramatically change the defamation uh, litigation landscape and, and at least in my opinion, I know uh, my panelists <laughs> may disagree, I think it's in a, in a bad way. Well, thank you for that. Before we thank this panel, just I guess I'll do the housekeeping real quick. You're back at it, or are you coming up to do that? Okay, 
Uh, you're, but we're back at 11.15, so uh, if Nick, if you want to come up and say more, but I, okay. So there'll be a break for 15 minutes, but I thought this was a fascinating discussion among some very distinguished panelists. So.